number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number nine, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place. Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC. His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy. But I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. 
What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War, what is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I'm gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pill Mm -hmm. Yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is going to cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, that didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. 
When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. At number 10, Royal Enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like, what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. 
At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually, his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage, and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously, this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land, this guy had it all. Literally, he had anything you can think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. 
horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We have At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going with that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle, and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, Neutronstein Castle. Go check it out, it's literally a paradise. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan. Logan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory, bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period. It involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food, because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. 
tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up, tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course, but tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think that's a noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashion accessory trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is there so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot. Get out of here. At number six, eternal youth. I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many, many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number five, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. 
This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm I'm not funny. Oh. Number 10, Joseph Mangeli. All right, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. This man is the only entry from the Second World War on today's list, and that's mainly because online guidelines make it practically impossible for me to talk about the evil German dictator or members of his party. So also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners at Auschwitz. So at Auschwitz, he was one of a number of medical professionals who selected victims to be sentenced to the gas chamber or be spared for his experimental research. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to another, do amputations to try and sew that part onto another twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with typhus or another disease, and uh, way too many other experiments. Can you tell he liked twins? And to the surprise of no one, more often than not, the twins would pass away during the procedures, or you know, he would just have them killed afterwards so he could do an autopsy for funsies. If one twin died from a disease, yeah, the other one's going just to mark the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors, and he would uh, collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it off for research. He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. Now remember, this was before the age of colored contacts. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of research. Now he tried sex change operations, he tried removing organs, and operating on victims without anesthesia. Oh, and if that wasn't disgusting enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. Throughout his time at Auschwitz, Joseph sent his colleagues in Germany red fluid, body parts, organs, skeletons, and even fetuses that have been taken from prisoners. Yay. Number 9, Putin. Well, Vladimir Putin started off reasonably well, you know, in his career, although there are um, some stories that his cronies planted explosives in Russian apartment buildings to help him snatch that presidency back in 1999. Granted, the folks who tell those truths keep going missing, so I'll get the Cliff's Notes version and pray I don't get nuked on the spot. One month after then President Boris Yeltsin plucked Putin from obscurity, oh and by the way, he was a KGB official at the time, which, yeesh, and made him prime minister, an explosion leveled a nine story apartment building on Moscow's outskirts. Sidebar, if you don't know what the KGB was other than me shuddering just now, they were a security agency that make all the other ones in the world look like young folks trying to enforce rules for funsies. The pre-dawn blast on September 9th of 1999 reduced the building to a smoking pile of rubble, killing more than 100 people. A second building, less than 600 kilometers away, was rocked by an explosion on September 13th, 
killing 119 this time. Days earlier, a car exploded in a small town bordering the war ravaged region of Chechnya, where reignited fighting was already spilling into neighboring regions. That blast outside the apartment building in the town of Buynask killed dozens. If I got the name wrong, I apologize. I'm not the best with every language. French and English are my forte for a reason. It was followed seven days later by a truck explosive that destroyed a nine story building in another southern city, killing 17. On September 23rd, Putin asserted to the, you know, everybody that bad guys in Chechnya were to blame and ordered a massive air campaign within the North Caucasus region. When asked a day later about the campaign targeting what he called terrorists, Putin responded with the phrase that will forever be his catchphrase. We will pursue them everywhere. We'll catch them in the toilet. We'll wipe them out in the outhouse. The statement became a Putin catchphrase and uh, set the tone for the 20 years of rule that followed. The longer he's in power, the more evil he's become. Leveling Grozny, attacking Georgia, grabbing the Crimea, carpet kabooming in Syria, imprisoning, poisoning, and assassinating opponents and you know muzzling the free press when one would think you know oh it can't get worse yeah he had another surprise the unprovoked attack of Ukraine, which, you know, an independent and peaceful nation back in February of 2022. But thanks to the heroism of the Ukrainian people, it's not completely the walkover he expected. So fingers crossed he maybe gets uh, voted out in the next election. Granted, it's a little tricky when people who oppose him have that weird coincidental habit of going missing. Number eight, Korean Kims. It's pretty difficult to distinguish between these two evil leaders, father and son, of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's a country led by a dictator where the people have no say and a monarchy with the father being succeeded by the son. Over time, there's actually been three Kims in that family that suggests that uh, being evil might just be like a generational thing, you know, part of your genetics, kind of like having an oily nose is one of mine. Under Papa Kim Yong II, aka the Dear Leader, which is a bucket of irony I don't have time to unpack, millions of folks died because of food scarcity. Amnesty International condemned him for leaving millions of North Koreans in poverty and detaining hundreds of thousands of people in prison camps, where, yeah, a lot of them died. Now, baby-faced Kim Jong-un was not much of an improvement. Human rights are non-existent, and his true or imagined opponents, or people he just doesn't like, are killed with methods that are going to give me nightmares for the rest of the year. While the general population suffers, the Kims spend whatever money they have on the development of nuclear weapons, because, you know, why not just make things worse? Number 7, Dr. Phil. First, it's very important to understand that Dr. Phil is not a real doctor anymore. While he does have a PhD in psychology and used to have a license, he is no longer a licensed psychologist and cannot legally practice in the state of California, where he lives and films a show. Now, emphasis on used to. Look, while I can't state with certainty why he is no longer licensed, if you go back to 1988, a decade before his first appearance on Oprah, a 19 year old client of his alleged that he carried on an unprofessional sexual relationship with her, would touch her inappropriately, and intentionally kept her totally dependent on him. The Texas State Board of Examiners of Psychologists, try saying that five times fast, investigated the accusations, along with claims that Dr. Phil inappropriately provided this young lady with part time temporary employment while still carrying on a therapeutic relationship. Their findings never referenced the accusations of sexual misconduct, but they did discover that the doctor sustained an improper dual relationship with the client by acting both as her therapist and her employer. The board issued him a letter of reprimand, assigned a psychologist to monitor his practice, and required him to take an ethics class and a complete psychological evaluation. Whatever the reason may be, Phil McGraw is no longer a licensed psychologist and he hasn't been for quite a while. He believes that his show's primary goal is to let people know that it's okay to treat problems and get help, and deliver understandable information about how to live one's life. Which, you know, that's a cute soundbite and all. But Dr. Phil's show regularly exploits people with serious mental illnesses and disabilities for financial and entertainment purposes, if you can even call that entertainment. In one instance, Todd Herzog, a former winner of the hit reality TV show Survivor, appeared on the show in 2013 to discuss his drinking problem. However, However, he was so drunk that he had to be carried onto the set and lifted into a chair. Before you wonder why a supposedly trained psychologist is something so cruel as to put a man too drunk to walk on national TV, first consider the horrendously immoral and unethical actions that led to this situation. According to Herzog, he was set up. His dressing room came with a full bottle of, um, spicy juice. After drinking all of it, a staff member supposedly handed him a Xanax, which he took before he even went on stage. Which all of this doesn't even scrape the surface of the accusations of misconduct and bad psychology that have followed Dr. Phil throughout his career. If I were to say all of those, I'd be here all day. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? 
weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, arming squire. Being at night, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths. At age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times. Moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. The guy was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistance. So it did their assistance. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed. I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box, because porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods, so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you wouldn't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay. Thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it. That's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right? Not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar. Eh, doesn't matter, we're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a 
hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years. You're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay. It's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go. You may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good. I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year. Couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever. That's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings. Would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you. Number 10, Charlie Chaplin. This might have been the biggest shocker to me today. I had no idea he married and had relations with so many girls under the age of 20 when he was uh, much older than them. So in 1918, for starters, Chaplin hastily tied the knot with 17-year-old uh, actress Mildred Harris, a decision he would soon come to regret, saying they were irreconcilably mismatched. Following the divorce, he married married 16-year-old Lita Gray, another actress with whom he had a bitter breakup. From the first day of marriage, he made his perception about her clear and called her a little fool whore. I hope you get what I'm saying there. On their train back to California from the marriage, Chaplin suggested Lita jump off the train to end her misery. Interestingly, Chaplin didn't like his wife, but according to her, he remained a human s machine. When she announced she was pregnant for the second time, his behavior got even more erratic. He would take up to eight showers a day and monitor the listening devices he had installed in her bedroom and patrol their house's grounds with a pistol at night. By the end of the same year, Lita headed for a divorce, stating how Chaplin had uh, pulled that same piece at her and threatened getting rid of her what she had. Lita's more elaborated passages surfaced when she claimed how throughout the marriage life, Chaplin forced her to gratify his abnormal, unnatural, perverted, and degenerate sexual desires. Next on his list was 22-year-old actress Paulette Goddard. History doesn't have an exact record of the year they married, but she moved into his mansion and got cast as a leading actress in modern times. Charlie bullied her on sets, a primary reason for their separation, telling people how he had to teach her things about acting, and those remarks would leave her crying. And in 1943, while well, in the middle of a high-profile paternity suit, 54-year-old Chaplin married 18-year-old Una O'Neill, to whom he had been introduced by a Hollywood agent. O'Neill's father, playwright Eugene O'Neill, was so upset by the match that he disinherited her. But unlike his other relationships, this one actually lasted. The two stayed together until Chaplin's death at age 88, and they had eight descendants. Jeez, that's a lot of marriages. I'm technically cheating a little bit on the history word here, since Tom Cruise is one of the most recent names on this list, but I couldn't leave a high-ranking Scientology member off of the uh, evil list. He has allegedly reached OT8, which is the highest currently achievable level of the cult. Uh, pardon me. As always, I'm getting ahead of myself. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices invented by Ron Hubbard, who developed a set of ideas that he called Dianetics, which he represented as a form of therapy. An organization that he established in 1950 to remote it went bankrupt, and he lost the rights to his book in 1952. Too. But he then recharacterized his ideas as a religion for tax purposes and renamed them Scientology. By 1954, he had regained the rights to Dianetics and founded the Church of Scientology, which remains the largest organization promoting the cult. In 1967, he established a new elite group, the Sea Organization, or Sea Org for short, the membership of which was drawn from the most committed members of the church. By 1981, the 21-year-old David Miscavige, who had been one of his closest aides in Sea Org, rose to prominence. Now, Hubbard died at his ranch in Creston, California on January 24th of 1986, and Miscavige succeeded him as the head of the church, a position he holds till this day. It was actually at Tom Cruise's wedding day, to now ex-wife Katie Holmes, that people started realizing that Miscavige's wife Shelly was missing, and when a former Scientology member started asking around, she was punished for asking. There are just too many evil things about the cult for me to talk about right now, but you just gotta know that to be that high ranking at a cult, you gotta be evil. Number 8, Steve Jobs. While I love and appreciate my iPod and the iPhones I've had over the years, Steve Jobs was no saint. In fact, his success can be attributed to his ruthless behavior, which is kind of commonplace with anybody that makes a billion dollars. In his biography, there are plenty of examples, from firing people at Pixar without notice, to storming out of a five-star hotel that he thought wasn't up to his standards, and berating service workers that he didn't consider up to his standards. Now, 
Well, that's all icky. You might be asking where the actual evil is, and don't worry, there's plenty. For starters, he not only neglected his daughter, Lisa Brennan Jobs, who he had with an ex-girlfriend, but he was also just like straight up rude and weird to her. Her in her memoir, Small Fry, she painted him like a jerk who once told her that she smelled like a toilet. However, the creepiest revelation was when Lisa revealed that Steve liked making out with his new wife right in front of her. So in the book, she describes Steve pulling in his wife for a kiss, moving his hand closer to her breasts while moaning theatrically, and when Lisa tried to excuse herself, Steve stopped her and told her to stay since they were having, in his words, a family moment. It's important that you try to be part of this family. Okay. Moving on before I hurl. Probably his biggest evil moment though was when he cheated his friend and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak out of money. While the two worked together at Atari, Steve asked his partner to build a scaled down version of Breakout, saying they would split the profits. And after four sleepless nights, Wozniak finished the game and got a whopping $350 for it. He later learned that Steve had lied to him about how much money he made from the game and had actually pocketed most of the profits for himself. Honestly, that's the stuff movie villains get based on. Number seven, Albert Einstein. After you invent the theory of relativity, I guess Yes, you can get away with being like a little bit of a jerk, and Albert definitely was. From being incredibly racist against Asians in his travel journals to being a serial adulterer. Travel diaries he wrote during a months long voyage in the 1920s reveal that in his private moments, the Nobel winning physicist portrayed people of other races, such as, you know, Chinese and Indians, in a stereotypical dehumanizing way. His unfiltered musings about the people he saw and interacted with during his journey show that, you know, eh, he harbored some pretty racist about those who didn't look like him. His reflections about the Chinese folks were callous, even insulting. Although he called them industrious, he also described them as filthy and obtuse. He claimed that they were a peculiar, herd-like nation, often more like automatons than people. He saw them as intellectually inferior, quoting that the Chinese are incapable of being trained to think logically and have no talent for mathematics. He was also not the nicest of folks he allegedly loved, having created a baffling to-do list for his first wife, Maleva Mark. This list included rules such as, you will see to it that my clothes and linen are kept in order, that I am served three regular meals a day in my room, Room, and you will expect no affection from me. You must leave my bedroom or study at once without protesting when I ask you to. Hard pass. Number six, Osama bin Laden. Yeah, he doesn't really need an introduction. Remember 9-11? Yeah, he was the organizer and mastermind, sending himself and way too many innocents to their death. He became America's most wanted and justice was, you know, finally served on May 2nd of 2011 at 1 a.m. Thank you, Navy SEALs. They also found um, a huge stash of no-no tapes in his compound because apparently the self-righteous threat persecuting women for being loose was not above sampling the strictly condemned fruits himself. Number five, Caligula. Many Roman emperors can be described as self-centered, but this one's appetite for amusement, decadence, and scarlet elixir were on a whole other level. The emperor's short temper and even shorter attention span resulted in countless deaths of his subjects. Caligula killed people for just funsies. In one particularly vile uh, situation, he even ordered his guards to put spectators in an arena to be eaten by wild animals because he was bored during a, you know, an intermission. I just lose hours scrolling on TikTok and playing silly games on my phone when I get bored, which, you know, isn't often. The emperor was indulgent and purposely wasted money, which led to starvation amongst his subjects. He openly slept with married women and sold his sisters to other men, which I guess seems kind of mild after having people killed to kill your own boredom, but you know, simply put, he was scummy. Number four, Jim Jones. As if I was gonna do a list of the worst men in history and not include a single cult leader. So back in the 1950s, Indiana native Jim Jones founded the People's Temple, a group that he claimed promoted socialism and equality with religious elements of Christianity. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, he moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its main headquarters in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though three to 5,000 is probably more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be outside the potential danger zone. The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to uh, see what was going on. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with them and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Ketuma. There, they were intercepted by self-styled temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing the congressman, three journalists, and one of the defectors as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spire. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists that were sadly killed in the attack. 
But that evening in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a concoction of cyanide laced, grape flavored flavorate. Oh, right, this is where the phrase drinking the Kool Aid comes from, but it actually wasn't Kool Aid, it was the off brand stuff. All in all, 918 people died, including 276 minors. When members wept and showed signs of dissent, Jones counseled, Stop the hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialists or communists to die. No way for us to die, we must die with some dignity. On a tape, Jones can be heard saying, Don't be afraid to die, adding that death is just stepping over into another plane and a friend. Jones directed that the youngest folks be killed first, and his wife Marceline apparently protested against this. Uh, so then she was forcibly restrained and then joined the other adults in poisoning herself. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink. And some folks thankfully did survive by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9 11, this was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to think about. Number three, Pol Pot. This vile leader of the Khmer Rouge regime was the architect of the Cambodian genocide and devastating policies that led to widespread famine and deaths from preventable diseases. The regime's xenophobic and racist views and policies led to the widespread killings of minorities all throughout Cambodia. The regime also imprisoned and destroyed those who opposed it. Prisoners were subjected to horrific medical experiments, which often resulted in agonizingly drawn out deaths. Many prisoners, including those too young to consent, were executed in the infamous killing fields and buried in mass graves. To save bullets, they were killed with pickaxes or smashed against trees, which is so much worse. Now, Pol Pot and the regime ended the lives of between 1.5 to 2 million Cambodian citizens, a quarter of the country's population. The most mind boggling part for me is wondering how this wasn't taught in school, or at least my school growing up. Number two, Chris Brown. If y'all don't remember, 14 years ago, on the February 8th of 2009, Brad's reputation was immediately tarnished when he physically harmed his then girlfriend Rihanna after a pre Grammys event. At the time, Rihanna was only 20, and she was left with visible injuries to her face and was hospitalized as a result. Now, Chris Brown was 19 at the time, and he pleaded guilty and accepted a deal of 1,400 hours of community service, five years probation, and domestic violence counseling. And look, while folks try to defend him, he wouldn't have made today's list if he was a single instance offender. But let's check the history book, shall we? In 2013, Chris Brown was arrested for felony harm in Washington, D.C. After he and his bodyguard were involved in a physical altercation with two men outside a hotel, the pair spent 36 hours in jail and the singer was ordered to stay at least 100 yards away from the man he was accused of harming. In 2015, Brown allegedly hit a man in Las Vegas after an alleged argument over a basketball game at the Palms Casino Resort. The next year, he was sued by his ex-manager, who filed a lawsuit against him, claiming that he had been viciously attacked. And in 2017, he was ordered to stay away from ex-girlfriend Karushi Tron after she put a five-year restraining order against the singer. He's been sued by other women for sexual harm as well, so how he still has some sort of a successful career boggles my mind. Number one, Louis B. Mayer. This is one name I didn't even have to look up today. As a lifelong fan of Judy Garland, I've had a bone to pick with him for quite some time. So in front of his staff, Mayer presented a calm, paternal presence. But behind closed doors, he was known for temper tantrums complete with loud sobbing and furious ranting. Most terrifying of all, these rages would go as quickly as they came, and then he would put his icy mask back on. Textbook signs of narcissism. Trust me. Elizabeth Taylor famously clashed with him constantly, and dubbed him a monster for the way he tried to rule every detail of her life. Now, Some of the worst allegations against Mayer come from Judy Garland. According to her, Mayer frequently groped her and made her sit on his lap. At other times, he would innocently place his hand on her left breast to show her how to sing from the heart. Oh, and this was when she was just a teen. He was particularly awful to Judy, calling her his little hunchback because of her short stature and curved spine, and encouraged her to take diet pills to slim down and look less girlish. Thanks in part to his actions, Judy was plagued with eating disorders and insecurities all the way until her tragic early end. At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. 
At number nine, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Cameron, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number eight, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? At number seven, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was the only male heir left to inherit, so on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. Number six, John Hamm. Oh, the handsome Mad Max star has a lot of female fans that love his charm, but the actor, kind of like his famous character, is pretty good at hiding his dark side. In 2015, news broke that the former frat boy was in the middle of a violent hazing ritual in 1991, where he allegedly set a guy on fire. Not only did John beat up a pledge by punching him in the kidney, he also let the poor guy around the frat house with a claw of a hammer beneath his genitals. As for the pledge, the whole experience made him sink into a deep depression, which sadly makes sense. This broke my heart, because like until today, I very much enjoyed watching him on screen, but I guess I'll be able to villainize him better in Sucker Punch now. Number five, Bill Cosby. It emerged in late 2014 that the famed actor, formerly known as America's Dad, sexually harmed dozens of women throughout his career. Cosby was accused by over 60 women of bad things that I can't word. The earliest incidents allegedly took place in the mid 1960s, but dates of the alleged incidents continue all the way up to 2008 in 10 US states and in one Canadian province. Now Cosby has maintained his innocence and repeatedly denied the allegations made against him. Most of the alleged acts fall outside the statute of limitations for criminal legal proceedings, but criminal charges were filed against him in one case and numerous civil lawsuits were brought against him. As of November 2018, I believe eight related silver suits were active. In July of 2015, some court records were unsealed and released to the public from a specific civil suit, and a full transcription of its deposition was released by a court reporting service. In his testimony, Cosby admitted to casual sex involving recreational use of the sedative quaaludes with a series of young women, and he acknowledged that his dispensing of the prescription drug was illegal. In December of that year, three Class II felony charges of aggravated indecent harm were filed against Cosby in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, based on allegations concerning incidents in January of 2004. Now, Cosby was found guilty of three counts of aggravated 
aggravated indecent harm at retrial on April 26th of 2018, and on September 25th of the same year, he was sentenced to three to ten years in state prison and fined $25,000 plus the cost of the prosecution. So. 43,000 something? In 2014, Judy Huth filed a civil suit against Cosby in California, alleging that he had armed her in 1975 when she was too young to consent. That trial began in 2022, and thankfully the jury ruled in Huth's favor. So, good riddance. Number four, Elvis. Although everyone knows he famously met wife Priscilla Presley when she was only 14, that wasn't the only time he fraternized with folks that were a little too young. According to a former member of his entourage, Elvis was fascinated with the idea of real young girls. He was particularly obsessed with Virginia ones, which he called cherries, and excuse me while I retch. According to Baby Let's Play House, Elvis felt insecure about pleasing older women, and would invite groups of young fans to his house for sleepovers instead. And once he met Priscilla, those fantasies didn't change. Determined to keep her Virginia until their wedding day, uh, he would instead have role play sessions where she would dress up like a schoolgirl and he would dress up like a teacher. Once the two married and had their first spawn, however, Escapade stopped. Priscilla wrote in her memoir that Elvis had mentioned to her before they were married that he had never been able to make love to a woman who had given birth. When Elvis finally upgraded to adult woman, dating 21 year old beauty queen Ginger Eldon after his divorce from Priscilla, he continued to treat them like crap. Ginger wrote in her memoir that Elvis once fired a pistol into her bedroom when she refused to bring him yogurt. Lovely. Number three, Vlad the Impaler. Also known as Vlad Dracula, he was Prince of Wallachia three times between 1448 and his death in around 1476 or 77. The character of Dracula was loosely based on Vlad due to his sadistic personality and cruel acts done to the people of Wallachia, where he reigned as prince three times between 1448 to 1462 and killed about oh, only 20% of the population. Works containing the stories about Vlad's cruelty were published in Low German in the Holy Roman Empire before 1480. They described Vlad as a demented psychopath. Path, a gruesome killer, and a masochist Caligula and Nero. One tale explains that Vlad had a big copper cauldron built and put a lid made of wood with holes in it on top. He put people in the cauldron and put their heads in the holes and fastened them there. He then filled it with water and set a fire under it and let people cry their eyes out until they were boiled to death. And you know, he invited just overall frightening, terrible, unheard of punishments. He ordered that women be impaled together with their suckling young on the same stake, stuck on their mother's breasts until they died. Then he had the woman's breast cut off and put the little ones inside head first, thus he had them impaled together. Together, he impaled victims through the um, rear end till the steak came out of their mouth. A German pamphlet once read that he had young folks roasted, and then he would feed them to their mothers, and he cut off the breasts of women and forced their husbands to eat them. You know, nightmare cruelty. Number two, Hugh Hefner. While it might not seem shocking that the man who claimed woman empowerment came from seeing them in bunny suits through the male gaze, you know, being a bad guy, just how awful he was may raise some eyebrows. He manipulated and drugged dozens of young women into taking part in degrading acts while masquerading as a champion of freedom. He would also host weekly pig nights, during which he would bring in a dozen Schmex workers he considered ugly to have friends. Holly Madison, you know, a lovely woman who dated Hefner for eight years, told how Hefner refused to use protection during and how the Playboy Bunny lifestyle had her considering taking her own life. Linda Loveless, the 1970s um, adult video star who found fame with the film Deep Throat, said she was treated like a piece of meat and forced to perform oral German Shepherd while Hefner and his friends watched. I could go into more detail, but I don't think I want to. Number one, Gandhi. Yeah, sure, he was an activist who led India to independence, but it also turns out that he was kind of a In the book, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, it was revealed that Gandhi was a separatist who wrote to the natal parliament that general belief seems to prevail in the colony that the Indians are a little better, if at all, than savages or the natives of Africa. He later wrote to a health officer in Johannesburg that he was concerned about the mixing of the South Africans with the Indians. If that wasn't awful enough, he frequently used his power to take advantage of young women in their late teens and early 20s. His inappropriate behavior was so bad, it caused his personal secretary, R.P. Paris Suram to blast him in a strongly worded letter. Now, his secretary gave him an ultimatum. Either stop manhandling women or I'm not working for you anymore. And Gandhi responded by telling him that uh, you're at liberty to leave. Yucky. All right, coming in at number 10, we've got Aristotle. You know, Aristotle has been considered to be one of the greatest thinkers and philosophers in history, but he was also a little scandalous with his thoughts too, at least by our modern standards. Turns out that Aristotle was quite the misogynist. He even wrote saying that, quote, a woman is perhaps an inferior being and that women were, quote, as it were, a deformity, end quote. 
I mean, damn, Aristotle. Have you seen a woman? Like, we're pretty awesome, you know? You're just jealous. But there's a bit of a bright side here, though, because although Aristotle believed that women were inferior, he still believed that women needed to be part of society and that their happiness was a requirement for society to function effectively. Even though he did give us some credit for being a requirement for the success of society, he did kind of screw us over for millennia because his philosophy shaped a lot of how society viewed women. So yeah, thanks a lot, Aristotle. You really did a number there, didn't you? Number nine, Grover Cleveland. The 22nd and the 24th US president. He's the only president to leave after one term, but then come back later on. There you go, change his mind. He was initially elected in 1885. Even back in those days, presidential scandals were underway. Grover was involved in a relationship with a younger woman named Maria Crofts Halpin, and then years later, Halpin came forward and said, surprise, you are the father. Cleveland sent child support, but he didn't fully admit it. He also didn't deny it either, he was kinda like, just stood there, just threw money, and just didn't answer any questions. So when he ran for president in 1884, his rivals caught wind of this whole scandal, and instead of Twitter not, you know, existing at all, they had to resort to chants. Yeah, opponents would chant, Mama, where's Pa? Gone to the White House, ha ha ha. Now as far as chants go, that's pretty weak. The guy still won, you know, so do a little bit better. It doesn't have a ring to it. Grover's sister though, Rose, she was the first lady to the now bachelor president until 1886. That's when he got married. Now at the same time, Rose Cleveland started to see a married woman named Evangeline Simpson. There were letters that surfaced afterwards where Evangeline referred to Rose as her everything. After Evangeline's husband died, the two finally got together and ran off to Italy. How romantic is that? Now compare that to some presidential scandals today. This sounds like a happy ending somewhat, but it gets a lot worse on this list. Coming in at number eight, Franklin D. Roosevelt. If celebrity news has taught us anything, it's that marriage scandals are the most scandalous of them all. Everyone wants to gossip about that, so up next, let's talk about Franklin D. Roosevelt and his great love affair. FDR was considered to be one of America's greatest presidents, leading the nation through the Great Depression and being the only president to serve for more than two terms. But even with all of this praise, we all know that everyone has their flaws, and FDR's flaw was that he couldn't keep his hands to himself, at least where his love life was concerned. It turns out that Roosevelt had a mistress for many years. The scandal first started in 1918 before he even became president. Roosevelt was married to his wife Eleanor, but was secretly seeing someone on the side, a woman named Lucy Mercer, whom FDR had hired to be his wife's secretary. Eleanor ended up finding a stash of love letters written between FDR and Lucy, and when she confronted her husband, she made him promise to never see her again and to sleep in separate beds from then on. This whole bed agreement didn't really last all that long, as FDR was able to finesse his way back into Eleanor's good books, but that wasn't all he was able to finesse. He was also able to get back with his mistress who stayed by his side until his death in 1945. Number seven, Spencer Tracy. When they were first introduced to each other on the set of Woman of the Year back in the early 40s, Katherine Hepburn found Spencer Tracy irresistible. Just simply irresistible, love at first sight. Their chemistry on and off screen, I mean, it was obvious. It shows in their work. It's not uncommon now for actors to fall in love on set. Sophia Bush and Chad Michael Murray, I mean, come on guys, love is obviously real. You can't help it sometimes. The sad reality was that Spencer Tracy was a married man at the time. He was married to Louise Treadwell and they got married way earlier in 1923. So at that point, sadly, they were having marital issues. But because of Spencer's Catholic background, he didn't believe in divorce, so they had to stay married. And they began to live separately, and then Spencer and Hepburn began their lifelong relationship until Tracy's death later on in 1967. This was always an odd one to me, because it's like divorce is a no-go, but cheating and then lying about it to friends, family, and coworkers. I mean, the Lord works in mysterious ways, I guess. I don't know. At number six, sew to an ox. Now, Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. 
When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediment, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksali Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number 5, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, an interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There's a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah and it was traveling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number 4, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but we will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number 3, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. Control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. You would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. I number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zung. What made their death so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. 
For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments. And historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Kicking off the list at number 10, must love licorice. Okay, we'll start off a little tame. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous French emperor, the famous military leader from the 1800s. Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for conquering a large part of Europe. Bet you didn't know he was obsessed with licorice though. Way too much, he would eat this all day, every day. Ugh, feels gross. Look, as somebody who can't stand licorice, I already feel bad for Josephine. Licorice breath at any time of the day coming your way? No, no thank you, I'll hard pass. Napoleon carried licorice around with him at all times. This guy ate so much of it, his teeth became stained. They turned black. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's black licorice too. Not the strawberry pull and peels, those are great. I'm talking about 1800s black licorice. It would come in lozenges. If somebody offered me a lozenge and it was black licorice, I'd call the police. Smack it out of their hands. Number nine, George IV. When it was time for King George III to pass on the crown, of course, next in line, heir to the throne, is his eldest son, also named George. What if you became king in 1820? Would you be noble? Would you do monologues in the sunset as you enriched your homeland? Kings like to do that a lot with their off oh, the hair still. Or would you do what King George IV did and make horrible financial decisions every single day? The guy would just party all day as well. He would gamble every day, he would buy expensive stuff that he did not need, and on top of that, he would never do any of his royal duties. Guy wouldn't do his job. His father had to step in, classic. He figured the only way to settle all these new debts set in motion by George IV, in order to clear those up, George now has to marry his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The arranged marriage happened on April 8th, 1795, and what was supposed to be a happy day for all was a nightmare for all included. They hated each other as soon as they met. I mean, obviously, he was a fool. George got heavily intoxicated for the wedding. He was just hammered the entire time. And then nine months later, almost to the day, they had a child. And then right after that happened, they went their separate ways. So yeah, horribly unhealthy relationship. Once George became king in 1820, he then tried to divorce her. Like, what a fool, just let it go. Let it all go, let her go. Number eight, Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century was at first Gian Maria Visconti, but after he was taken out, his brother, Filippo Maria Visconti, had to step up to the bat. As a ruler, Filippo was better. His brother had been cruel previously, hence the untimely departure. So this was a good move at first, so we thought. Now Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother on paper. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, which we love that. He ended up passing away of natural causes down the road, which is, you know, nothing like his brother. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody, not even people close to him. He hid in his palace most of the time, and it was odd because he thought that he was ugly. That's why he hid his face. Kind of sad, right? Filippo hid his face, and maybe you feel bad for him now, right? Just a little bit. He died of natural causes, and he was alone all that time. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. This guy was horrible. He was jealous of his wife Beatrice Lascaris de Tenda because she was twice his age, twice as smart, and twice as powerful. So, Filippo had her taken out in a courtyard publicly September 13th, 1418. Yeah, he accused her of adultery just cause, cause he could and he had some suspicions in his dark room by himself hiding his face. History is ugly and sometimes it's literally ugly as well. Number seven, George I. King George I, couple of Georges on this list, okay? Long before his British ruling days, George was in Germany. He was actually the elector there, and he'd been married before around 1682. Originally, he married Sophia Dorothea of Seal, but the entire time they were married, it was horrible. George would straight up bring other women home because he just felt like he could. Like, he, like he literally argued that he could, given his role. He's like, oh, I could have these women, and we could do all this in front of you? Of course, I'm this person of this. Like, no, you're a fool, you're a jerk, really. He would have numerous mistresses and he would purposely flaunt them. So Sophia thought, okay, if you can have numerous side hustles going on, I'll move on myself. So she began seeing a Swedish count. <laughs> okay. She began seeing Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. Now when George inevitably found out, he was violent at this point. He was upset. He divorced Sophia and then imprisoned her. Yeah, when he became king of Britain later on in 1714, she didn't come with him. Yeah, it's not just horrible with Sophia either. The Duke had also 
been taken out, sadly. His love for Sophia ended up getting him killed. What a mess, all these Georges are so messy, the worst. If your name's George, don't be a mess, just be nice. Hit that thumbs up if you're a George, change the game. Change the stats up. Coming in at number six, Peter the Great. You know, he may be called Peter the Great, but after hearing about the seriously messed up thing he did, you'll probably end up thinking to yourself, ah, you know, maybe he's not so great after all. Peter the Great was the emperor of Russia in the 17th century, and he did a lot to bring his people into more modern times to keep up with the rest of the Western world, but he was also kind of a he was known to grab the bosoms of his wife's ladies in waiting, even when his wife was in the room. He was also known to have had many mistresses and was deeply submerged in double standards. You see, to him, he could sleep with as many people as he pleased, but when his wife got herself a little boo thing on the side, Peter was just not cool with it. When he found out that his wife Catherine I had a sneaky link, Peter came up with some bogus criminal charge to put against his wife's side piece and had him executed. Now you might think, yeah, that's pretty scandalous and messed up. But wait, there's more! On top of having Catherine's secret lover executed, he had the guy's head removed, placed in a jar, and put it in Catherine's room so that she would have to A, be traumatized, and B, have a reminder of her betrayal. That's seriously messed up, so again, Peter the Great, not as great as you think. Number five, Marlon Brando. Rita Moreno and Marlon Brando never got married, but the two are remembered for their roller coaster of a relationship. They lasted for eight years after meeting on the set of the 1954 film Desire. Rita was 22, and the Puerto Rican born American icon even got an EGOT. She got an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and a Tony. Insanely talented. Now, Brando, of course, went on to do a couple of those, you know, student films, something about a streetcar and a godparent of some sorts. The fourth greatest male movie star, surprise, surprise, pursued other women at the same time. He married Anna Cashby in 1950. 1957, and then Movida Castaneda in 1960. He had children with both of them, all the while Brando was still pursuing a relationship with Rita. Now she once wrote, he broke my heart and came close to crushing my very spirit with his physical infidelities and worse, with his emotional betrayals. Rita even attempted to take her own life, that's how much pain she was in with Brando in this relationship. We were obsessed with each other, she says, but I couldn't take the humiliation of him being with other women. Brando ended up helping her with therapy down the road, and until the end of Brando's life, they remained friends. Still in touch. He did the calling though. She never called him first after that point, which is nice to know. At number four, Caravaggio. You may know Caravaggio as the famed painter from the 16th and 17th centuries, but apparently he was much more than just an artiste. Caravaggio was a lot more scandalous than you might think because during his life he got into a lot of trouble with the law, the worst of it coming from when he actually just murked somebody. The artist was someone who was known to spend his long, lonely evenings in the comfort of a lady of the night, and apparently this comfort was just enough justification to end someone because when the employer, I guess you could say, wanted to sleep with this lady of the night, Caravaggio went full beast mode and eliminated his competition. But he really said, hands off the merchandise, right? The way he went about offing his competition was pretty brutal. Because of the NSFW nature of this feud, the artist went to uh, relieve his opponent of his manhood. But since Caravaggio was an artist and not a doctor, he didn't really know what he was doing and things went pretty left. The artist didn't intend to kill the other guy, but he accidentally ended up severing the man's artery and he died. The artist later fled to a small town to escape the scandal and the authorities and remained in hiding until he died. Number three, Cary Grant. Another couple that met on set, another rocky road of relationship. When Sophia Loren and Cary Grant worked together on The Pride and the Passion in 1957, Cary made Sophia the lead of his next film in 1958 called Houseboat. Now, this isn't really uncommon per se. Directors like to recast. Christopher Nolan has used the same people in like six of his movies. It's really confusing actually. Thing is, Cary Grant had a wife at the time and she also wrote the original script for that film. Now we got a scandal. His wife was actress Betsy Drake. Originally, Betsy was the lead alongside her husband, every theater kid's dream, essentially. But Cary Grant got a new script in the works that cut his wife out of the film entirely. Roasted. Sophia Loren was also in a relationship at the time, so it was just all bad. She was supposed to marry Carlo Ponti, but because of those pesky Catholic laws that I mentioned earlier, he couldn't get a divorce from his wife. So she was in a rough spot for a while before deciding ultimately on Carlo that she was the that he was the best for her. Cary Grant really didn't help anybody at all. The guy got a new script, then cut his wife. That's ruthless. Imagine cutting your own wife. At number two, Voltaire. 
When I was in school, we learned about the French author Voltaire. If you ever had to read his book Candide, I'm so sorry. But I'm even more sorry to have to tell you this, but Voltaire was a horrible guy. His thoughts about a certain group of people were quite horrible, and I guess you could say it was pretty scandalous. It turns out that the author was quite critical of people of Jewish faith. As he was raised as a Jesuit, he harbored a lot of animosity towards Jewish people, and as an author does, he didn't hold back from talking about his feelings towards them. When referring to Jewish people, Voltaire once said that they quote, were as adept in turning fables into history as they were turning secondhand clothes into new ones, end quote. I don't think I could ever see Voltaire the same way again. But then again, I really hated Candide, so I don't know. And finally, coming in number one, Frank Sinatra. The 1940s icon died in 1998, but in 2011, Harry Connick Jr. came forward about the inappropriate behavior Frank had with his wife Jill. Harry performed in front of Frank in 1994, but he bombed the show. His nerves caught up, he froze, it happens. Now when Harry and Jill were leaving, on the way out they bumped into Sinatra on the elevator. Connick felt embarrassed for bombing, he apologized, said he's usually a lot better, that he deserved to see better. Sinatra didn't even say a word, he just grabbed Jill, kissed her, and then left. Yeah, there's a few words for that, that's not allowed here, or ever for that matter. Doesn't matter what songs you did, just don't do that, that's f***ing gross. This isn't new though, sadly. In the late 30s, Sinatra was arrested, originally for seduction charges, but once it was revealed that she was married, the charges changed to adultery. When Sinatra was 50, he married Mia Farrow, who was 21 years old at the time, she was an actor, and Frank wanted her to give up acting, but after she went on to star in Rosemary's Baby, he divorced her after two years of marriage. Controlling asshole. The guy brought papers to her on set while she was working at her job. That's what he decided to do on his day off. Maybe he has a few classics, sure, but Frank Sinatra is not the gentleman some of you believe he is, that's for sure. Jen, what a drag. Bachelor number one, what would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William the First, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number 9. Let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry, and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cashback. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number 7. Terrible Ivan He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. 
A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect, to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number six, hair to the throne. Okay, I kicked off this list roasting Napoleon and his licorice choices, but of course, he's done much worse things than have bad breath and stained teeth. Napoleon's marriage to Josephine was first fueled by love and friendship, but things quickly changed. Marie Josephine Rose Tasher de la Pagerie was born in 1763. She had two children with her first husband, but that marriage was also not a happy time. They separated, and Josephine met Napoleon in 1795. Napoleon at this point was married at the time, and they had an affair, and they were deeply in love, like actually in love, and Napoleon proposed to Josephine in 1796, and they married later that year. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon led the French army in Italy, and while he was gone, both of them ended up having affairs. So many affairs in this. Like, does love even exist? What the hell? 1804, Napoleon crowned himself and then crowned Josephine, proclaiming her empress. A few years passed, and after finding out Josephine couldn't bear any more children, Napoleon made a list of possible and eligible princesses. Just a list, and just left it out. Like, how, how awful is that? In November 1809, Josephine agreed to the divorce, and come 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte's final word on his deathbed was, Josephine. Yeah, a little darker than a licorice, just a tad. Number five, King Henry VIII. The second wife of King Henry VIII. She was found guilty of treason, and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. She had also apparently, apparently, had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend, and when I say close, I mean, they were really close. He was the groom of the stool. So they were close, and on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Hmm, I wonder why. This list will explain a few reasons. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish. Anne wasn't present when these events even went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533, your honor. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her own little neck before being taken out with the sword herself. Yeah, all dark. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to get an old elm chest from the Tower Armory. How horrible is that? Number four, a bit better. Another one of King Henry VIII's wives, Anne of Cleves. Where do we even begin here? This one is, honestly, this one's pretty sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic, in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, King Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister, and then come back and compare them. This is like the birth of Tinder. I'm not even joking, this is how he did it. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. Yeah, compared her to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site, write that in. I praiseth thou beauty, madam, to a silver dollar. A silver sea sand dollar shining in the moon. What, I don't know, just click it. Click send, see what happens. Then a treaty was signed, a few weeks later Anne arrived to England, and Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like the portrait, apparently. How horrible is that? Ah, you look nothing like this Victorian painting. How dare you? It's 6 a.m. and you've been riding a horse for four weeks and you don't look like this Victorian painting? Shame. He tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. And on January 6, 1540, their marriage was official. You can't unswipe this marriage, rich boy. Anne later accepted the divorce, gladly, and then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Number three, Christian VII. Christian, there's an ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. I don't know how else to say it, here we go. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, he was a young lad, he was spoiled, he was a little comfortable with his body, maybe too comfortable, and he would often just have his hands in his pants hanging out. He was like one of those, you know, rich king, he was kinda like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, he would just have his, just sit back and like suck on candy and stuff and just, you know, fool around. I don't know, it was gross. Middle of dinner, this guy would pass around food to his family with those gross hands. He would alternate hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp. Now, it's unknown, but historians believe maybe, just maybe, he was a tad mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks. Go wash your hands. Twice. Number two, King Henry VIII, again. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII again again. He's pretty bad, not gonna lie. 
Henry VIII was king of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, as we've heard by now, and all of them have went south. When Henry married Catherine, he was 49. She was a few years younger. She was actually a lot younger, classic 1500s way too young. And when they got married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had received a nasty jousting wound, so now he was gravely overweight. He didn't do anything. He just laid around all day and complained. So Catherine, of course, just wanted some, you know, shred of a life. And being, again, quite young, too young, she decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s because then the young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. And finally, coming in at number one, Henry II. The relationship between Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine is pretty memorable. It's memorable in all the wrong ways, of course. When they first met, things were good, dare I say, with both of them. They were both young, and he was gonna be king. He was young, king, guy, young man who's gonna be king. And Eleanor, I mean, she was married, but once she got an annulment, their love was good. You know, their love was good and young and ready to be young king stuff. After the annulment in 1152, Henry and Eleanor tied the knot officially a couple weeks after. Love moves quickly, apparently. Henry started having affairs, because of course he did. At this point in his list, we're not gasping at affairs, sadly. But come 1173, Eleanor had convinced their sons to go against father. <sighs> yeah, Henry didn't take this well, and he had Eleanor locked up for 16 years. He had died, so after that point, she had resumed the royal roles, because at this point, those two boys had grown up and inherited the throne, Richard and John. But being locked up for that long, what a nightmare that relationship was entirely. I figured we'd end on a kind of tame one, one where she kind of came back and it was good. Kind of good, dare I say? I don't know. Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with delight. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you wanna be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now, so maybe maybe be a lawyer, call him up, say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight, and like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number eight, ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice, it could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, war of the bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Modo I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. 
Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wielding visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I am for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4 Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Rosepierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3. All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies in what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2. Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes through their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy creeps me out, man. Whoa! Number 10. Watch Party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly. No, 
Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village, or even from two different opposing villages, and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. <laughs> what? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes. <laughs> Ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil. Get him! Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310, in the French town of Rune, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples, it's sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology, and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. 
The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a Bucktooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number 4, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, sleeping general. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queez hit night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time aside in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Yeah.